NASA, going nowhere since 1958. If you've been paying any attention to the world around you, you have easily realized that almost everything is a lie. Dare I say, a conspiracy. The world is not at all what it seems. Some may see it, many do not. But to understand one lie, you need to recognize a few. We need to think of all the lies around us, because every piece of the American way of life has sold out to corruption, big business, and government. The media narrative and hypocrisy runs deep as they go about their business of easily corrupting minds with constant propaganda to the point now where every news piece and story has been distorted beyond recognition. And yes, even science has been tainted. Let's just consider some of the many lies, like sugar, marijuana, and tobacco science, or public water fluoridation into human-caused global warming and climate change science. How about GMOs and Monsanto, which is now owned by Bayer, which leads to big pharma and medicine, drug makers keeping you sick rather than healing you, flu shots and vaccines rather than the medicinal use and healing power of plants, hmm, which makes them no money, a healthy diet instead of low-fat snack cakes and packaged foods that are just making us fat and sick, bringing fear porn with infectious diseases, measles outbreaks, and Ebola, which fuels the healthcare industry and medical malpractice, biotech, pesticides, the EPA, and the lies continue onto the oil industry and free energy, down to the very education system that teaches it, as well as a false history, pushing Big Bang and evolution as science with their dinosaur and missing link frauds, or teaching Common Core, simply public indoctrination programs. And then you have the college admission scams, and the universities creating huge student debt, putting people deeply indebted to the Federal Reserve Banking System, which isn't even federal, onto the stock market, financial scams, and the rest of the lies. All of this in a free society, while being watched and tracked and managed by Google, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or even censored on YouTube, while Hollywood continues to corrupt the mind, pushing some alien agenda and a satanic message. And the music industry isn't far behind with their corruption. How about the kidnapping and human trafficking with child sex exploitation and the sexualization of minors, while pedophiles go free because of a corrupt justice system of lawyers, courts, and judges that speak another language altogether? All of it leads back to the government, which fuels the mainstream media with their hypocrisy and fake news stories. Every government agency is entirely corrupt and weaponized against the people. The IRS, the NSA, the NSF, FTC, CDC, DOD, EPA, etc. And who owns and operates the fake media juggernauts? Well, our very own CIA, who has been deeply involved with all the newspapers and magazines, just see Operation Mockingbird, pushing propaganda constantly with their incessant mainstream narrative, including press releases from government agencies, universities, corporations, and companies getting rich off government contracts. How about the false flags and covert government operations? Just see Northwoods, Gulf of Tonkin, Operation Paperclip, and thousands of others. The entire political scene with election fraud and dishonest polls, the whole left versus right two-party system pitting citizens against each other, or the entire CIA involvement in the military-industrial complex, as more war, more conflict equals more money and more growth. Or the so-called war on drugs. Our own federal government has been engaged in a shady operation of alliances with the world's largest drug cartels. Our incarceration percentage has grown by six times since Nixon declared a war on drugs in 1971. When planes took arms to the Contras in Nicaragua, these same planes returned with cocaine, shielded from law enforcement by the CIA. Yeah, an illegal drug trade. Just another pointless sham proving our own CIA is engaged with criminals and is criminal itself. Just look at the weapons and arms dealings of the CIA while actively trying to take yours. The constant barrage of lies and deceptions like the official 9-11 story and the government-run commissions. So, so many lies, and I could do a film on each one of those separately, and perhaps I will. But this film asks you one important question. If they lie to you about all that, if they have deceived you at every possible turn, what makes you think that they're telling you the truth about space. You see, sometimes people want to know the truth, but many times they do not. 
They like the idea of truth, but not the actual real truth. When it comes to the United States space program, however, in my opinion, people certainly don't want the truth. They want the lore, the ideals, that patriotic feeling, the ideas of space travel, trillions and trillions of miles, American dominance and ingenuity, and the brilliant minds of mankind coming together to do the impossible. It's our destiny to be in the stars. This has always been the reason for space, making dreams come true, inspiring children and adults to do more, to strive for more, to reach for the stars and to achieve the impossible. In this movie, I will explain my opinion of space and space travel. I will talk about what I think space is and isn't. And to do so, I'll talk about the past 11 presidents as well as the current president, Donald Trump. I'll go through the list of presidents and show that they have all cared little for space travel other than national prestige, and the reason for this, I believe, is multifaceted. I believe NASA to be little more than a jobs program, mixed with some research and development, focusing on engineering and technology. They also sell a fantasy and a worldview to the population. They instill pride and wonder, but what they haven't done and don't do is go anywhere. Hence the name of this film, NASA Going Nowhere Since 1958. Now, I could go deep into the various space-related deceptions and pick apart NASA films scene by scene, and while I'll do a little of that, this film is much different. Maybe I'll do other films on the various lies and pseudoscience pushed by the space agency, but this film will go president by president, give a little background, and show that it has always been and continues to be a back-and-forth game of sorts, where NASA can blame the president and the president can blame NASA. In the end, allowing research and jobs to continue while ultimately going nowhere. Of course, we're going to spend most of our time on Kennedy and Nixon, especially since this month has been the 50th anniversary of quite possibly the largest deception ever pulled on the people of this earth. The nonsense assertion that 50 years ago, NASA sent men to the moon. Many people may not agree with anything I say throughout this film, and that's okay. I don't agree with most of what I hear in the mainstream media. That's because I'm looking for the truth and not just the story I'm supposed to believe. If you don't agree with me, or see things a different way, well, it could be because you trust the mainstream media, meaning you do believe what you're supposed to believe, what this world wants you to believe, in which case I think you'll always be missing the truth. What I want to make clear from the start is that you're free to believe whatever you want, as am I. Eddie Bravo was on the Tinfoil Hat podcast and summed it up quite well when he said, <laughs> Hey, listen, I'd rather be thought of as an idiot for you not trusting the generous. government than Nobody a traitor for defending them. I would rather be thought as a moron for not trusting criminals than a sellout and a traitor for defending them. The real I don't believe liars and I don't trust criminals. Once you've lied to me, I no longer see the need to believe anything you say. The difference is I'm not lying to you at any point throughout this film. I'm giving you my 100% honest opinion on the subjects discussed. Agree or disagree, these are my personal beliefs. Space has always been an amazing arena for populist politics and fantasy conceptions. When NASA began, the space pioneer and ex-Nazi SS member Werner von Braun was an absolute genius at forging public opinion with the ideas of space and space travel. He knew the power of space-related gimmicks. Together with the other dream maker and fantasy extraordinaire Walt Disney, they joined up to greatly sway public opinion by presenting space as a sci-fi fantasy adventure, a reaching for the stars, much like a Disney movie. Werner von Braun said, There's no Bucks without Buck Rogers. Of course, Buck Rogers was a fictional space character that debuted in 1928, becoming a very popular comic strip. Then it became a television series. It was so popular that many newspapers launched their own science fiction strips right after. Imitators like Flash Gordon and Speed Spaulding and John Carter of Mars. The adventures of Buck Rogers became an important part of popular culture, and by 1930, Buck Rogers took his rocket ship and left Earth. Buck Rogers has been credited with bringing into popular media the concept of space exploration, following those few before him like Jules Verne and H.G. Wells, and those who came after him like Arthur C. Clarke. So, as Werner von Braun said, there's no Bucks without Buck Rogers. Let's start there and talk a little bit about the money behind the space industry, because this is a terribly important aspect. Only once you completely understand the financial implications can you begin to understand why and how they continue to get away with going nowhere. First off, NASA receives $56 million a day of taxpayer money. While it may only be half of a percent of the yearly U.S. budget, 
They also get many other funds from donations, admissions, etc. But here is the most important fact to understand. Think of how big the music industry is worldwide. Enormous, right? Now think of the movie industry, Hollywood and global, even bigger. So where do you think the video game industry and economy rates with those two? What if I told you the video game industry is now more than the music and movie industries combined? Wow. This article states, Forget about being a movie star. Forget about becoming the next Beyonce. If you want to be rich and famous in the entertainment world, you should start playing video games right now. Gross video game sales have outweighed box office receipts for over two decades, and they surpassed home video and theater earnings combined 15 years ago. The video games industry has earned more revenue than the movie and music industries combined every year for the past eight years. That's right, video games have passed the music and movie industry 15 years ago and have earned more revenue than the movie and music industries combined every year for the past eight years. In 2018, the video game industry raked in $137 billion. That's $70 billion in mobile, $14 billion in tablet games, $56 billion in smartphone games, $33 billion in PC games, $4 billion in browser PC games, $28 billion in boxed and downloadable PC games, and over $34 billion in console video games, a total of $137 billion for that year. A huge industry compared to the movie industry, which only brought in $43 billion. Even if you include home entertainment and home theater, you still don't reach the video game industry. And music is less than half of the movie industry at only $20.5 billion. Crazy business, huh? Can you imagine one of those industries just going away because people realized it was all a fraud? Well, not really, because people know those industries are entertainment industries, selling fantasies, right? So where do you think the space industry stands compared to music, movies, and video games? What if I told you it is almost double all of them combined. Shocked? Well, you should be. The space industry was at $385 billion in 2017. Video games were at 137. Video games plus the movie industry, plus the home entertainment industry, plus the music industry don't even reach the space industry. So now you can start to see why presidents stand behind it, why it is needed, because it makes so much money and creates so many jobs. Whether anyone goes anywhere or not, As long as you believe that they have gone somewhere, or eventually will, the space economy continues to grow and thrive. So where do we go, Obama? The moon? Mars? You and I know this is a false choice. We have to fix our economy. We need to close our deficits. But for pennies on the dollar, the space program has fueled jobs and entire industries. For pennies on the dollar, the space program has improved our lives, advanced our society, strengthened our economy, and inspired generations of Americans. And I have no doubt that NASA can continue to fulfill this role. Both of these articles claim that the space industry will soon be a trillion dollar industry. From Space News, it says, Forecasts that predict the space industry to grow to a trillion dollars by the 2040s will require the development of new markets, even with the modest annual growth rates needed to achieve the goal. A panel session on June 26th at Space Frontier Foundation's New Space 2018 conference here noted that several reports in the last year by investment banks predicted that the global space economy, currently valued at about $350 billion, could grow to $1 trillion or more in the 2040s. And from the Office of Space Commerce, it says, Today the global space economy is roughly a $400 billion economy, of which about 80% is commercial activity, and the United States claims a little less than half of that commercial activity. We used to think about space activities being concentrated in a few key areas, in Florida and California, and in this great state of Texas. But the fact is that there's not an area of this country these days that isn't deeply affected by the space industry. That's very exciting, and it is a very promising time for the space industry as we have the convergence of leadership, finance, and technology that is creating opportunity at unprecedented speed. We used to think about space as an area where some new development was a decade away, but in fact, these days, it might be just two years or two months away. Of course, always in the future. Not here yet, but it'll be here soon. Hi, I'm George Jetson, and I live in the 21st century. That's Elroy. You have to watch him or he'll track up the ceiling. Here I'm dropping Judy off at school. Blondes away! Oh, that's Jamie, my wife. Rosie! Coming, sir. Are you starting to see NASA's role yet? Can you tell what importance NASA has? Make money, create jobs, inspire Americans, inspire the world, Sell fantasy, but going anywhere isn't the important thing. 
whether it's in 1980 for those around in 1960, or in 2000 for those of us who were around in 1980, or in 2020 for those people living in the year 2000, or in 2030 or 2040 for those of us living now. We will be going to Mars, we will return to the Moon, we will launch a James Webb telescope, we will land and mine asteroids, we will redirect an incoming meteor, we will send another rover to Mars, we will have a colony, we will have a lunar base and launching pad, we will have a drone fly above the moons of Saturn, we just need more money and more time. We will continue to provide jobs, we will continue to inspire, we will continue to innovate, and we will continue doing what we've always done since 1958. Going nowhere. So who knows about the deception, you ask? Do the presidents know? To be honest, I have no idea. It's just another lie that is told to the world population. One of the many, many deceptions. And who knows about it? I'm not exactly sure. But now, if you just think about it, and look at what NASA has really provided, inspiration, you'll see it doesn't really matter who knows. Who knows if fluoride is harmful? Do dentists? Well, some, but they were taught it is essential to health. Do the presidents know? I don't have a clue. But all that's important is that I know and remove it from my life, much like I've done with the NASA storytelling. I know they aren't on Mars, and I know they aren't going there. I know no man has walked on the moon, and no man will. I've come to grips on that reality. Maybe some presidents know, others may not, but all of them realize the importance of telling people, we have gone and will go again. Carl Sagan said, one of the saddest lessons of history is this. If we've been bamboozled long enough, we tend to reject any evidence of the bamboozle. We're no longer interested in finding out the truth. The bamboozle has captured us. It's simply too painful to acknowledge, even to ourselves, that we've been taken. Once you have given a charlatan power over you, you almost never get it back. Again, to realize this fraud, you have to first accept that you've been lied to and are being lied to. What will that take? Well, I'm not sure exactly. The evidence is everywhere. How about the quote by William Casey? And despite what you may hear elsewhere, it has been verified by a source who was there that the then CIA director William Casey actually said in 1981, we will know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. Despite Casey being under investigation by Congress for being involved in a major disinformation plot involving the overthrow of Libya's Gaddafi in 1981, and despite Casey arguing on the record that the CIA should have a legal right to spread disinformation via the mainstream news that same year, this quote continues to be argued by people who weren't there and apparently cannot believe a CIA director would ever say such a thing. Well, but spreading disinfo is precisely what the CIA would and did do. This 1975 clip of testimony during a House Intelligence Committee hearing has the agency admitting on record that the CIA creates and uses disinformation against the American people. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA? who are working for television networks. This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, ships had been established and I was told about them. And or maybe this Bush press conference where he admits that the federal government has a long-standing practice of using prepackaged news reports and calling them news when the government themselves has created them. You told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these... Um, 
pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling, to that Justice Department opinion. Uh, this has been a long-standing practice of the federal government to use uh, these uh, types of videos. The Agricultural Department, as I understand, has been using these videos for a long period of time. Uh, the Defense Department, other departments have been doing so. It's important that, the, that they be based upon the guidelines set out by uh, the Justice Department. Now, I also, I think it'd be helpful if local stations then disclose to their viewers if that's, you know, that this was based upon a factual report and they chose to use it but evidently in some cases that's not the case so anyway to guarantee that's happening by including that language in the prepackaged report yeah i don't you don't look i mean oh you mean a disclosure i'm george w bush and i well some way to make sure it couldn't air without the disclosure that you believe is so vital uh you know ken i mean there's a there's a procedure that we're going to follow and the local stations ought to if there's a deep concern about that ought to Tell their viewers what they're watching. Yes, sir. Or maybe you need to hear an apology directly from Clinton about the thousands of government-sponsored experiments performed on American citizens without their approval. This report I received today is a monumental document in more ways than one. But it is a very, very important piece of America's history, and it will shape America's future in ways that will make us a more honorable, more successful, and more ethical country. What this committee learned, I would like to review today with a little more detail than Dr. Faden said, because I think it must be engraved on our national memory. Thousands of government-sponsored experiments did take place at hospitals, universities, and military bases around our nation. The goal was to understand the effects of radiation exposure on the human body. While most of the tests were ethical by any standards, some were unethical, not only by today's standards, but by the standards of the time in which they were conducted. They failed both the test of our national values and the test of humanity. Informed consent means your doctor tells you the risk of the treatment you are about to undergo. In too many cases, informed consent was withheld. Americans were kept in the dark about the effects of what was being done to them. The deception extended beyond the test subjects themselves to encompass their families and the American people as a whole. For these experiments were kept secret and they were shrouded not for a compelling reason of national security, but for the simple fear of embarrassment. And that was wrong. So today, on behalf of another generation of American leaders and another generation of American citizens, the United States of America offers a sincere apology to those of our citizens who were subjected to these experiments, to their families, and to their communities. When the government does wrong, we have a moral responsibility to admit it. The duty we owe to one another to tell the truth and to protect our fellow citizens from excesses like these is one we can never walk away from. Our government failed in that duty, and it offers an apology to the survivors and their families, and to all the American people who must, who must be able to rely upon the United States to keep its word, to tell the truth, and to do the right thing. Perhaps you need to read the released CIA documents stating that the CIA considered enlisting mafia gunmen from Sam Giancana's Chicago outfit to take out Castro. Luckily, Robert Kennedy was opposed to that plan, worrying that such a service rendered would make Giancana difficult to prosecute in the future. And as part of the anti-Castro Operation Mongoose, the CIA floated the idea of an Operation Northwood-style false flag attack on American soil in order to discredit Castro. We could develop a communist Cuban terror campaign in the Miami area, in other Florida cities, and even in Washington. We could sink a boatload of Cubans en route to Florida, real or simulated. We could foster attempts on lives of Cuban refugees in the American states, even to the extent of wounding in instances to be widely publicized. Exploding a few plastic bombs in carefully chosen spots, the arrest of a Cuban agent, and the release of prepared documents substantiating Cuban involvement 
also would be helpful in projecting the idea of an irresponsible government. Which government do you think is irresponsible? And lastly, we can see that the CIA and NASA have been up to no good from the start. After Francis Gary Powers was shot down over the Soviet Union during a CIA spy flight on May the 1st, 1960, NASA issued a press release with a cover story about a U-2 conducting weather research that may have strayed off course after the pilot reported difficulties with his oxygen equipment. To bolster the cover-up, a U-2 was quickly painted in NASA markings with a fictitious NASA serial number and put on display for the news media at the NASA Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base on May 6, 1960. The very next day, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev exposed the cover-up by revealing that the pilot had been captured and confessed, and espionage equipment had been recovered from the wreckage. It was not until April 2, 1971, that NASA received two U-2 aircraft for high-altitude research. These, of course, were the first U-2s to actually be operated by NASA, as opposed to the CIA or the U.S. Air Force. Now, all of this is meant to show you that you've been lied to, and you have every right to question what liars and criminals tell you especially when they put it in textbooks and force it into the minds of children and put it in the mainstream news daily, which of course is made up of only some CIA employees. So the lies are obvious and the lies are many, but do you still believe them about space? Well, I don't. And now we can begin with the presidents. So why the presidents? Well, the president is not only commander-in-chief, he's the commander-in-chief of NASA. NASA is an administrative function in our government, and it reports directly to the president of the United States. It is the president and his staff that set NASA's agenda and request the budgetary resources needed to carry it out. So no one other than the president ultimately has greater influence over the direction and the pace of the U.S. space efforts. Congress then has to approve it, but normally makes little to no changes to the presidential recommendations. When it comes to the presidents, in my mind, the job is pretty simple. You toe the line, you make a splash if you need it for re-election, celebrate the so-called achievements to show that you care, speak softly of tragedies, but ultimately you can't make NASA do anything or go anywhere. Up first is Dwight D. Eisenhower, president from 1953 to 1961. His vice president, of course, was Richard Nixon, hand-selected by Prescott Bush. He announced in 1955 that the U.S. would launch a satellite a few years in the future. I guess it takes a long time. But he was beat to the punch when Russia launched Sputnik in 1957. They say this is why he signed legislation that started NASA, but he wasn't too worried about Sputnik as he called it one small ball in the air. But the public was scared, so NASA to the rescue. He didn't think we needed a civilian space company, thought everything should go through the DOD, but Nixon and LBJ convinced him. Remember, the Texas connection. Prescott handpicked Nixon, and LBJ was the Senate Majority Leader. Eisenhower believed anything space should be all DOD, so much so that he decided the astronauts should be all military. Makes sense, right? Guys who have taken an oath of secrecy? But he saw what Russian propaganda had done, and so follow the leader. Calm the public fears with NASA and his calming voice from space in 1958. The world got to hear his voice from a tape recorder on a satellite. Hilarious. Listen in. We have on tape or recorded the voice of the President of the United States as it's being broadcast to Earth from our great satellite put into orbit last night. Through uh, Radio Press, WBAI, and uh, this particular program are able to bring you the voice of the, U of the President of the United States as it is being endlessly repeated in the endless orbit around the world, a voice addressed to all men everywhere. And so NASA was created, an open and transparent agency in contrast to Russia. Speaking of which, check out the movie The Cosmonaut Cover-Up to see how deep the Russia lies ran. Even Nikita Khrushchev's son, Dr. Sergei Khrushchev, speaks to the massive lies and the propaganda. How massive? Well, now they don't even think Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space. Just another guy on a reverse bungee jump, really. They even delete cosmonauts from photos. It's pretty funny, 
and not too bad if you like that kind of documentary. So check it out. Here's a small clip. After several decades of propaganda, lies, and official denials, the truth about one of humanity's greatest achievements can now be told. He gave NASA the Army's Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, and the German rocket team led by Nazi Werner von Braun. Remember, Jack Parsons was a principal founder of JPL with his Suicide Squad. Lastly, Eisenhower had no desire for a space race or moon mission, well, because he wasn't up for re-election. He leaves quietly, handing space off to Kennedy, but does leave us with two warnings. One of them we've all heard many times before. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. The second one you may never have heard before. Let's listen in. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. A scientific, technological elite. Well, doesn't that certainly sound like what we have today? A scientific space agency that is allowed to go nowhere, constantly, changing plans every few years, spending huge amounts of money and resources, but never really getting anywhere, literally. But they keep being handed dollars and creating jobs, buying equipment, funding research, but all of it just seems to keep going round and round. Next up, we have John F. Kennedy, president from 1961 till his assassination in 63. His vice president, of course, was Lyndon B. Johnson, someone instrumental in NASA's start. First off, Kennedy knew nothing about space, but he wanted to make a splash for a possible re-election, so he asked LBJ to find out if we could do something big in space, and was told possibly the moon in 67. So he agreed to increase the NASA budget big time and made a huge proclamation. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this decade is out, then we must be bold. He wasn't even technologically minded, but certainly bold. And so he declared it, but even NASA Administrator James Webb knew that statement was trouble. Remember, Kennedy announced the moon in May of 61. But listen to this convo in November of 62. Things weren't looking so good, but Kennedy had already said it and was hoping for this to help his re-election. He even states in this off-the-record meeting that he is not interested in space. as you 
you find out how you could get out beyond the Earth's atmosphere and into space and make measurements, uh, uh, several uh, scientific disciplines that are very powerful have, have begun to converge on this area. Yeah, you know, I think it is the top priority. I think you ought to have that very clear. Uh, you, some of these other programs can slip six months or nine months, and uh, nothing particular is going to happen. It's going to make, but this is uh, important for uh, political reasons, uh, international political reasons, and uh, for uh, this is whether we like it or not. In a sense, a race. Uh, if we get second uh, to the moon, it's uh, nice, but it's. Uh, like being second any time, so that I, and if we're second by six months, because we didn't give it the kind of priority, uh, then of course that'd be very serious. So I think we have to take the view this is the top priority. Number one, there are real unknowns as to whether man can live under the weightless condition and you'll ever make the lunar land. This is one kind of political vulnerability I'd like to avoid such a flat commitment to. I agree that we want to be interested in but we can wait six months. But you have to use that information to do your thing. Yeah, but only when that, as that information directly applies to the program. Uh, Jim, I think we got to have that clear. Uh, yeah, I think you can learn. We don't know a damn thing about the surface of the moon, and we're making the wildest guesses about how we're going to land on the moon. And we could get a terrible disaster from putting something down on the surface of the moon that's very different than we think it is. And the scientific programs that find us that information have to have the highest priority, but they are associated with a lunar program. The scientific programs that aren't associated with a lunar program can have any priority we please to give them. Now, the other thing is, I would certainly not favor spending a section seven billion dollars to find out about space. Why are we spending seven billion dollars in getting fresh water from salt water when we're spending seven billion dollars to find out about space? But so obviously, you wouldn't put it on that priority, except for, except for the defense implications. And, uh, and the second point is the uh, the, uh, the uh, fact that the Soviet Union uh, has uh, made uh, this a, a test of the system. So that's why we're doing it. So I think we've got to take the view that this is the key program, and the rest of it, God, so that we can find out about it. But there's a lot of things we want to find out about. But you see, when, you, and everything else. when you talk about uh, uh, this, it's very hard to draw a line between what... Between what I, said, I think of... everything that we do ought to really be tied into getting onto the moon and ahead of the Russians. Why can't it be tied to preeminence in space, which are your own time? Because, by God, we've been telling everybody we're preeminent in space for five years. Nobody believes us because if they have the booster and the satellite. But I do think we ought to get it uh, you know, really clear that the policy ought to be that this is the top priority program of the agency and one of the two, except for defense, the top priority of the United States government. I, I think that that's the position we ought to take. Now, this may not change anything about that schedule, but at least we ought to be clear. Otherwise, we shouldn't be spending this kind of money because I'm not that interested in space. I think it's good. I think we ought to know about it. We're ready to spend reasonable amounts of money, but we're talking about these fantastic expenditures which wreck our budget and all these other domestic programs. And the only justification for it, in my opinion, to do it is because we hope to beat them, to demonstrate that starting behind it, we did by a couple of years, by God, we passed them. A lot of interesting things said there in late 1962. Kennedy had already proclaimed that we were going to the moon just a year earlier, even though we'd never even put a person in space. His re-election was not looking good if it was decided we couldn't go. So the head of NASA knew they had no knowledge of the moon or how to operate in space even. And JFK admits he isn't even interested in space. It's all a prestige thing. Now, by September of 63, Kennedy now doesn't even think we'll be first. Now he thinks we should go to the moon with Russia. Shortly after this speech, rarely heard, he is killed, and the cooperation idea disappears. Again, remember the Texas connection of Prescott, George H.W., and LBJ. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Space offers no problems of sovereignty. By resolution of this assembly, the members of the United Nations have forsworn any claim to territorial rights in outer space or on celestial bodies and declared that international law and the United Nations Charter will apply. Why, therefore, should man's first flight to the moon be a matter of national competition? Why should the United States and the Soviet Union 
in preparing for such expeditions, become involved in immense duplications of research, construction, and expenditure, surely we should explore whether the scientists and astronauts of our two countries. Of course, Kennedy is killed and the space race is back on. In steps Lyndon B. Johnson, who was president from 1963 until 1969. His VP was Hubert Humphrey. LBJ toes the line. He keeps the heavy funding going to NASA and continues to push for the moon. As Kennedy's VP, he was the chairman of the National Aeronautics Space Council, so of course NASA gets to keep their increased funding and LBJ pushes space big time. But he was also the president when the Apollo 1 fire took three lives. Well, four if you count Tom Barron. In my interview with Gary Corsair, you can find out a lot about this so-called accident. Tom Barron is the one that testified against NASA, and his report was lost. A week later, he gets hit by a train, dies, as does his wife and child. That train was on a NASA track that came from a NASA switchyard. There were two witnesses. One refused to ever speak. The one who did speak lived in a home owned by North American Aviation, the employer of Tom Barron. His lawyer died that same year from a massive heart attack. A reporter on Barron's side committed suicide by jumping out of a plane and not pulling his parachute. A worker that was said to be on the train when Barron hit it says that's a fabrication because he wasn't. And the coroner said, yes, that's my signature on the death certificate, but doesn't recall doing the autopsy. Also, Johnson allowed NASA to do its own investigation into the accident of Apollo 1. And remember, it was Johnson who was the one who started the Great Warren Commission, who of course concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone gunman. Good old LBJ. And then came Nixon, finally becoming president from 1969 to 1974 before resigning. He had two vice presidents, Spiro Agnew, before he resigned, and then Gerald Ford. We all know that he spoke via telephone to Neil and Buzz while they were on the moon 240,000 miles away. I'm talking to you by telephone from the Oval Room at the White House. And this certainly has to be the most historic telephone call ever made from the White House. I just can't tell you how proud we all are of what you have done. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. And for people all over the world, I am sure that they too join with Americans in recognizing what an immense feat this is. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. And as you talk to us from the sea of tranquility, it inspires us to redouble our efforts to bring peace and tranquility to Earth. For one priceless moment in the whole history of man, all the people on this Earth are truly one. One in their pride in what you have done, and one in our prayers that you will return safely to Earth. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here representing not only the United States, but men of peace of all nations and with interest and a curiosity and, and with a vision for the future. Uh, honor for us to be able to participate here today. And thank you very much, and I look forward, all of us look forward to seeing you on the Hornet on Thursday. He's also the one that got the shuttle rolling and gave it to California, well, because jobs equals votes, and it worked. Von Braun wanted Mars, but Nixon said no. He won re-election quite easily and kept the public occupied with the moon. So they kept their eyes off of what was going on in Vietnam, and it was a great distraction. Nixon said, I don't give a damn about space. I'm not one of those space cadets and he actually never made any kind of a space speech. However, in a time of turmoil, he felt that U.S. citizens needed heroes, and who better than American astronauts. In stepped Gerald Ford, who was never elected president or even vice president. He was president from 1974 to 1977. His vice president was Nelson Rockefeller, also not elected, but selected. He was only president for three years and didn't care much about space. He also renamed the first shuttle, which was originally named 
Constitution, but Ford renamed it Enterprise in 1976 to honor Star Trek, its fans, and its impact on society. Again, celebrating the idea of space. He had no plans for any kind of return to the moon or Mars. For the time being, the shuttle was enough to keep people happy. And of course, if you're looking for the connections, he was a Warren Commission member and also selected George Herbert Walker Bush as the head of the CIA. Let me call to express my very great admiration for your hard work, your total dedication in preparing for this first joint flight. It's taken us many years to open this door to useful cooperation in space between our two countries. And I'm confident that the day is not far off when space missions made possible by this first joint effort will be more or less commonplace. And may I say, in signing off, here's to a soft landing. Next up, Jimmy Carter became president from 1977 to 1981. His vice president was Walter Mondale. Neither of these guys were big fans of space. In 1979, Carter considered canceling the shuttle program altogether since it had so many issues like every single NASA program ever. But as usual with NASA, so much money had already been spent on the shuttles that he had to let it continue. He did do his job, however, as stated before, congratulated astronauts and towed the company line. NASA continued going nowhere. In one of the funniest videos ever, watch this Space Foundation public service announcement with Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. I don't know if we're supposed to believe that they're actually talking to each other via some satellite, or if we're supposed to think this is in real time, but it is pretty funny if we are supposed to be buying this absolute nonsense. Good afternoon, Mr. President. It's a lovely day here in Georgia. Good morning, Mr. President. It's a nice day here in California. California? I could swear we were right next to each other. With a communications satellite, we can be. That's one way space technology impacts on life here on Earth. Television, telephone, and radio signals bounced off satellites bring people together who are thousands of miles apart. They bring us world events as they're happening. They help us educate, entertain, and inform. But communication satellites are only one of the thousands of practical applications of space technology. In the months ahead, you'll be hearing about remarkable advances in the diagnosis and treatment of heart disease and cancer. New ways to generate electricity and control pollution. All of them spin-offs of space technology. That's why Jimmy Carter from Georgia and Gerald Ford from California agree space technology has down-to-earth benefits for everyone. That's pretty funny. I honestly thought at first that that was a Saturday Night Live skit. In the coming months, we will be curing cancer, reducing heart disease, mining diamonds from Pluto, and making puppies fly, all because of the thousands of practical benefits of space technology. Oh boy, do you believe it? Then came Ronald Reagan, the actor who was president from 1981 to 1989. His vice president was George Herbert Walker Bush. Of course, as expected, he was a fan of space, cheering on the shuttles, celebrating NASA's past glory, but never really pushing for the moon or Mars. People were content with the shuttle, for now, going where the shuttles went, nowhere. He was president for the Challenger disaster, so launches were postponed for a while. He also proposed a strategic defense initiative which was going to be a network of missiles and lasers in space and on the ground to protect the USA. The program was called Star Wars and considered very unrealistic. It was and never came to be. America is going to space again and we're going there to stay. <laughs> Commander Rick Hawk, pilot Dickie Co Dick Covey, and mission specialist Pinky Nelson, Mike Lounge, and Dave Hilmers are space age pioneers, but their spirit is rooted deep in our heritage. We're a nation born of pioneers, and we'll always create our future on the frontier. Americans can live no other way. Our early settlers knew great risks and made great sacrifices, but with their sacrifice, they moved the frontier forward and built a great nation. Neither can we stand still, nor be content, and we're not afraid. Ill fortune can slow us down, but it can't stop us. You can delay our long trek to greatness, but you cannot halt it. How better can we pay tribute to those who came before us than by continuing their quest for knowledge 
their struggle against limits by continuing to push toward the far frontier. Mr. President, would you like to have made a bigger commitment to the space program in terms of money for the future than you have? I'll try to do all that's possible. expand human knowledge of the atmosphere and space and to pursue the practical benefits gained from these activities in order to improve the lot of mankind. Men and women of NASA, well done. Your accomplishments in these two and a half decades have already served your country and the people of this planet well. Today we're reaping the returns that we've realized from our investment in space. And let me add, when the figures are put together, we're not only getting our money's worth, our commitment to space has been one of the best investments we've ever made as a nation. Community. <laughs> Perhaps NASA's greatest gifts have been the moments of greatness that you've allowed all of us to share. All of us, whether we were school teachers, actors, government employees, farmers, factory hands, secretaries, or the cop on the beat. All of us were along on those early Mercury missions. We were part of the NASA team launching probes into deep space to chart the unknown, to photograph the rings of Saturn and the surface of Mars. We were there and our hearts were filled with such pride. When Neil Armstrong, an American, the first person to set foot onto the moon said, one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. And we saluted right along with him when he planted old glory in the lunar soil. NASA has done so much to galvanize our spirit as a people, to reassure us of our greatness and of our potential. In recent days, the Space Shuttle has, as another NASA project before it or other projects before it, captured our hearts and imaginations. You want to go up in space? Been there for several years. Well, I agree with you on that. The actor certainly played his part. He towed the line, kept the dreams alive, he celebrated the past, and talked about going to the stars for good. I'm sure NASA was quite pleased. Next was Mr. Texas himself, George Herbert Walker Bush. He was president from 1989 to 1993. His vice president was Dan Quayle. Poppy Bush was a huge fan of space and had big dreams for NASA, ordering a big bump in NASA funds. He had big ideas, probably hoping for re-election, so he ordered the Space Exploration Initiative to send NASA to the moon and on to Mars. First for the coming decade, for the 1990s, space station freedom, our critical next step in all our space endeavors, and, and next for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, and this time, back to stay. And then... And then a journey into tomorrow, a journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. Each... But it was a big failure, big surprise. As soon as it was announced, Gore mocked it when he said, By proposing a return to the moon and a manned base on Mars with no money, no timetable, and no plan, President Bush offers the country not a challenge to inspire us, but a daydream to briefly entertain us. A daydream about as splashy as a George Lucas movie with about as much connection to reality. What George Bush had said was, I am pleased to announce a new age of exploration, with not only a goal, but also a timetable. I believe that before Apollo celebrates the 50th anniversary of its landing on the moon, the American flag should be planted on Mars. George H.W. Bush, May 1990. But after Gore mocked it, he ordered a 90-day study into the feasibility of his statements, and NASA came back and said, 30 years and $500 billion. That was, surprise, 30 years ago, and NASA has gone nowhere. And so again, big plans, big dreams, and NASA continues on, 
going nowhere. Before the 50th anniversary, a flag should be on Mars. Well, NASA can't even go back to the moon. Have they ever been to the moon? Well, the evidence alone should tell you the answer to that question. And then there was Bill Clinton, president from 1993 to 2001. His vice president was Al Gore. Immediately, he killed the space exploration initiative of his predecessor and brought things back down to Earth. Said we should send robots to Mars and kept the space station funded, even though, again, it was way over budget and well behind schedule, a NASA specialty. NASA did announce during his presidency that they might have found life on Mars, but nobody really cared and nothing ever came of it. He did, however, have something funny to say to Neil deGrasse Tyson. The most valuable thing I had for perspective in politics in the White House was a moon rock. I was going to ask you about the, When we the celebrated fact. the 30th anniversary of the walk on the moon in 1999, NASA came in with a vacuum-packed, you know, glass-enclosed moon rock that was taken off the moon in 1969 that had since been carbon dated at 3.6 billion years old. So I asked, because uh, I had supported the space program so strongly, I said, may I just borrow that till I leave? You can have it back when I go. I know it's not mine, but I, I really I bet they it. didn't say no to that question. They did not. <laughs> So when you see these uh, television coverage of the president meeting with the foreign leader or whatever in the Oval Office, there's two chairs and then there's this two couches and there's always a table between the couch, I put the moon rock on the table. And for the next two years, when we'd have like Republicans and Democrats in or people on two sides of any issue and they start really, really getting out of control, I'd say, wait, 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 you see that moon rock? It's 3.6 billion years old. <laughs> Now, we're all just passing through here, and we don't have very much time, so let's just calm down and figure out what the right thing to do is. And it worked every single time. Somebody, they looked, most That's everybody... That's a cosmic perspective sitting in the middle of your table. They were looking at an object that existed at a time they could hardly imagine, and it just gave them that little bit of space in their mind and spirit to try to figure out, okay, let's go at this one more time. And that's what we got to keep doing. We just have to keep moving around both out there and in here. And, you know, if you just keep stumbling toward Jerusalem, good things happen. <laughs> I mean, I may be wrong about it, but that's what I think. I, I just think, you know, that I'd give anything to be 20 again. I'd give up having been president and gamble on my chances in the future if I could live another 80 or 90 years just to see just what's so, going to happen. Just to see it. Just to see it. Just to see it. It's amazing what's going to happen. Yeah, it's all about the ideals of space, the idea behind the moon rock. That, by the way, was carbon dated to billions of years. I guess Neil missed that too. Look up carbon dating as a max of about 50,000 years, and that's even if you believe that. One of our young astronauts, 13-year-old Wayne Gussman from New Orleans, sees a future where being an astronaut will be like, and I quote, driving a car. Everyone will do it. That's a great dream. But that and our other dreams are clearly the natural extensions of the space program which began a generation ago. The direct descendants of the dreams of the three men we are here to honor today. Then came George W. Bush, president from 2001 to 2009 with Vice President Dick Cheney. New president, new plan. Gets pretty repetitive, doesn't it? In 2004, just in time for re-election, Bush laid out his vision for space exploration, which like his father, did set a direction and a timetable. Direction to the moon by when? 2020. Guess what? It ain't happening. That moon mission would be a stepping stone to Mars, said Bush. This may have been in response to NASA's 2003 report that blamed the Columbia disaster on the presidents, saying that there had been a failure of national leadership in not replacing an aging shuttle and not providing a strategic vision to guide U.S. civilian space activities. Well, NASA got what it wanted and still has gone nowhere. Bush also started the Constellation program, which would include a new spacecraft called Orion, a lunar lander, and new rockets. But it also never came to be. This time changed by the next president. <laughs> Any patterns here? Our third goal is to return to the moon by 2020 as the launching point for missions beyond. Beginning no later than 2008, we will send a series of robotic missions to the lunar surface to research and prepare for future human exploration. Using the crew exploration vehicle, we will undertake extended human missions to the moon as early as 2015, 
with the goal of living and working there for increasingly extended periods of time. More goals, more fails. It's a never-ending saga, always coming in the future. Then came Barack Obama, president from 2009 to 2017, his vice president, Creepy Joe Biden. Obama almost immediately got rid of the Constellation program of George Bush in 2010. Instead of going to the moon, Obama wanted to begin construction on landers for a 2030s trip to Mars, and for humans to visit an asteroid by 2025. Obama upped the budget for NASA to help them actually go somewhere. However, still, they've gone nowhere. By the mid-2030s, I believe we can send humans to orbit Mars and return them safely to Earth. And a landing on Mars will follow. And I expect to be around to see it. I understand that some believe that we should attempt a return to the surface of the moon first, as previously planned. But I, I, I just have to say uh, pretty bluntly here, we've been there before. Buzz has been there. There's a lot more of space to explore and a lot more to learn when we do. So I believe it's more important to ramp up our capabilities to reach and operate at a series of increasingly demanding targets while advancing our technological capabilities with each step forward. And that's what this strategy does. And that's how we will ensure that our leadership in space is even stronger in this new century than it was in the last. This holds the promise of generating more than 10,000 jobs nationwide over the next few years. And many of these jobs will be created right here in Florida because this is an area primed to lead in this competition. We've seen that in the NASA's budget, which has risen and fallen with the political winds. But we can also see it in other ways, in the reluctance of those who hold office to set clear, achievable objectives, to provide the resources to meet those objectives, and to justify not just these plans, but the larger purpose of space exploration in the 21st century. In 2013, NASA Chief Charles Bolden put it quite simply, and maybe we should pay attention. Bolden warned of the importance of staying on target with space exploration. He said that if the next administration tries to change course and get NASA to lead another manned expedition to the moon, that it means we are probably, in our lifetime, in the lifetime of everybody sitting in this room, we are probably never again going to see Americans on the moon, on Mars, near an asteroid, or anywhere. We cannot continue to change the course of human exploration. And yet, that's what they keep doing. Going nowhere. And last, our current president, Donald Trump, who became president in 2017 with Vice President Mike Pence. He's not sure what he wants. He has said both, almost demanded both. He even offered NASA an unlimited budget if they could send men to Mars by the end of his first or second term and was told no, they couldn't. So with unlimited time frames and unlimited budgets, NASA still goes nowhere. How long will this last? Finally, we must think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it cannot be done. No challenge can match the heart and fight and spirit of America. We will not fail. Our country will thrive and prosper again. We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the Earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. Well, we will wait and see. He said the time for talk is over. 
He tried to give NASA an unlimited budget and they failed. So now the direction has changed. Donald Trump now wants to send NASA to the moon. Just as the United States was the first nation to reach the moon in the 20th century, so too will be, we be the first nation to return astronauts to the moon in the 21st century. And I'm here on the president's behalf to tell the men and women of the Marshall Space Flight Center and the American people that at the direction of the president of the United States, it is the stated policy of this administration and the United States of America to return American astronauts to the moon within the next five years. And that's why today, the National Space Council will send recommendations to the president that will launch a major course correction for NASA and reignite that spark of urgency that propelled America to the vanguard of space exploration 50 years ago. As you will hear, in these recommendations, we will call on NASA not just to adopt new policies, but to embrace a new mindset. That begins with setting bold goals and staying on schedule. To reach the moon in the next five years, we must select our destinations now. NASA already knows that the Lunar South Pole holds great scientific, economic, and strategic value. But now it's time to commit to go there. And today, the National Space Council will recommend that when the first American astronauts return to the lunar surface, that they will take their first steps on the moon's south pole. And here's the other thing that should be obvious. Five years from 2019 is 2024, which will be exactly when Trump and Pence will be leaving office if they're at the end of the second term. And again, this will just get pushed onto the next president who will come out and announce a new directive and NASA will go back to doing exactly what they've done since 1958, going nowhere. Okay, thank you very much. For almost six decades, NASA's work has inspired millions and millions of Americans to imagine distant worlds and a better future right here on Earth. I'm delighted to sign this bill. It's been a long time since a bill like this has been signed, reaffirming our national commitment to the core mission of NASA human space exploration, space science, and technology. All right, so in this film, we covered a few things. We discussed lies and deceptions and realized the world is not what we were taught. We discussed how large the space industry is and why it can continue to operate without actually going anywhere. And then I discussed each president simply to show that it is promises, promises, and never delivery. There is so much more to discuss under the banner of NASA going nowhere since 1958. My plan is to come back with future installments to cover the many other areas of NASA deception. Of course, I didn't get into the occult roots of NASA or Von Braun's shady history. I didn't show all the moon landing anomalies or how the rover, when sped up, looks exactly like a sand buggy. Didn't show the terrible liftoff videos. If you just think about it, though, the deception runs so deep. I mean, really think. There are only two locations that we can even go to, even if you believe all this nonsense. Mars and the moon, that's it, forever. There's nowhere else we can even reach. Even if you give NASA that much, they can't even go there. They're simply stuck. And if you ask me, it's because they can't go to either. So they will forever keep waffling back and forth. Even when someone sets a clear directive. But as long as it goes back and forth, up and down, they are allowed and encouraged, in fact, to go nowhere at all. They have an excuse. And so it goes back and forth, mission to mission, nowhere to nowhere. So the moral of the story really is you need to do your own research on all these matters. Don't believe me? Go look into Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke's movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Look into the movie Room 237 so you can see for yourself how Kubrick told you what's going on. You can see Danny playing with his cars in the hallway that matches the NASA launch pads in The Shining. How he rises up wearing the Apollo 11 sweatshirt. Look into the movie Eyes Wide Shut which Kubrick died days before its release, and ask yourself, why in the contract was it demanded by Kubrick that the movie had to be released on July 16, 1999, 30 years to the day after the Apollo 11 launch? So thanks a lot for watching. If you enjoyed this film and would like to see more, I could use your support. You can send me a dollar or five or the price of a movie ticket by going to paypal.me slash jaren, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash jarenism. And by the way, a huge shout out and a huge thank you to all my current patrons. You guys are the best and make this channel and this film possible. Or you can buy a shirt. The links to the shirts are in the description. 
So thanks again, and don't worry, I'll be here waiting while NASA continues going nowhere since 1958. This has been Jaronism. Till next time, peace.